Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. In this video, I'm going to ask the question, are modern lighting solutions as good for us as they claim to be? I hope that this will be a very valuable video that you would want to share with your friends, family and uh, uh, colleagues. I think this will have value for a wide community. And I think it introduces some concepts that people are maybe unfamiliar with where health issues are concerned. If you like the work of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, please consider supporting us. There are links in the video description. And also, why not subscribe and hit that little bell and like the video, because that really helps us. Okay, so let's get on with it. Here I have a selection of uh, light bulbs that I have purchased over the years. And I want to talk through my findings and experiences and also implications uh, from wider science. Before I get going, I want to quote this phrase, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy and wealthy and wise. Now, I was convinced uh, until yesterday that my dad made this up, but in fact, it was a quote attributed to Benjamin Franklin. And essentially, it's suggesting that sleep when you should be sleeping and wake up and do a lot when the daylight is there for you. Okay, so I want you to remember that as we go through this video. So one of the main justifications for purchasing new light bulbs is the efficiency. The other one is the lifetime. And so if we take the standard thousand hours you would expect to have got from an incandescent bulb and you say that you're using it for 2.7 hours per day, this would give you 370 days of use and approximately one year. Why have I chosen 2.7? Well, because that is what they quote on the uh, outside of light bulb packets here, 2.7 hours per day to give you your 10 years in this case. If you are only using it for eight hours a day, then uh, you would uh, burn your light bulb in a third of the year. And many of us can remember changing our incandescent bulbs uh, every three or four months. And if you're using it 24 hours a day, well, it wouldn't last much more than uh, one tenth of a year. So the newer light bulbs are supposed to last for much longer times. And here is a chart which you can look at in your own time. But often you are quoted that the best light bulbs you can buy are typically going to be lasting 25 years, which sounds extremely, extremely nice. So why wouldn't you want to buy that uh, and pay a little bit more for the pleasure of not having to change your light bulbs every four months? Uh, so that's that. And I want to look at some light bulbs that I have purchased over the years. And the first is a classic incandescent. Here it is. You can see maybe that the filament is down the bottom there and that it, it is dead. And you might be able to see a brown tinge, which is what happens as the filament evaporates. Or, and here's a little bit of a brown tinge there. Anyway, the incandescent bulb uh, apparently has an efficiency of between 2 and 3%. And this is a Philips bulb. And this, I think it cost me 50 cents or less. And uh, it's got a thousand hour life there. The interesting thing is this renders light effectively 100%. So, uh, you know, it, it gives you a, an accurate uh, rendering of all colors, uh, albeit at a color temperature of 2700 Kelvin. So this is a 100 watt light bulb and many of these ones here are similar or claim to be similar light outputs. Now the compact fluorescent here are 7 to 10 percent efficient. So if we can imagine that this was two and a half percent efficient, in fact, 100 watt incandescent bulbs are more efficient than uh, 60 watt or 40 watt incandescent. So the 100 watts are more efficient. So they, they're not the 2%, they would be above the 2%. So let's say this was two and a half percent and it's outputting 100 watts. Uh, this bulb outputs uh, 920 lumens uh, and it's rated at 60 watts, but you input 15 watts. And so this one here is effectively uh, outputting four times the amount of light as an equivalent incandescent. So you could potentially say that this, and it is a latter generation bulb, and here it is, 
um, uh, of the compact fluorescence. And so this might actually be bordering on 10%. And in fact, the one I showed you here is bang up to date. I bought this very recently. Uh, this is a 23 watts in and 112 watts out. And this actually puts this at around about 12%, something like that, uh, um, efficiency. So even higher than what is normally quoted for the efficiency of compact fluorescence. But anyway, this is at the upper end of that. And this if you went out to buy this today, although I bought it many years ago, uh, it cost $6.75, so very much more expensive. And it's apparently lasting for 15,000 hours. And I can actually tell you that <clears throat> I bought two of these at the time and this bulb still works. Uh, its light output is a bit diminished. It takes a bit longer to turn on and one of them failed. But this worked for <clears throat> many, many years. I'm not so sure that it lasted for 15 years, <clears throat> um, but perhaps it was in a room that I had on for a longer period of time. Anyway, um, I definitely can tell you it's still working now, so it lasted a lot longer than uh, four months. Now, the next one I have here is made by Tesla uh, company in the Czech Republic. Uh, this was a company that was set up in 1921 as Electra, and it then after the war became uh, Tesla in 1946. And it was, until 1989, effectively making all semiconductors, all electrical components, all radios, everything uh, in the Czech Republic. It's quite fascinating if you go to the uh, local uh, bomb raid shelter here, nuclear bomb raid shelter here, that's kept uh, functional to, to a degree. All of the electronics, all the radios and communications equipment in there are made by Tesla. Anyway, that's a by the by. But the, the bulb is here, and uh, it was relatively cheap. Uh, uh, it was three ninety five, so cheaper than the Lilliput Mega Man. However, I will say <laughs> that this bulb, despite being supposedly able to run for a very very long time, uh, twenty thousand hours. You know, that's more than fifteen thousand hours. I can't remember this running for more than about two years. Uh, I had a couple of them, and and so you know, um, much less impressive length of life compared to uh, the older um, compact fluorescent. Again, it has a color rendering index of eighty, uh, but it has a fifteen twenty one uh, lumen output, uh, and this is a uh, hundred watts. So you've got fifteen here to a hundred watts. So that's what four, five, six, more than six times two and a half percent. Uh, you are talking in the upper bracket of uh, efficiency uh, for a light emitting diode device. And so, uh, you know, this, you know, light emitting diode devices can actually be less efficient than uh, compact fluorescence, uh, some of them. So you do need to be careful when you're purchasing them. But at every stage, I always tried to buy the, be a good little citizen and buy the most efficient light bulbs I could afford. And uh, this had a good price, uh, but I can tell you it did not last very long. Certainly it's, it's, it's failed. I have a number of these that have failed. And it's definitely not uh, 20 years old. And, uh, you know, even if you were using it most of the day, this should still be working. So this is, was a little bit of a disappointment. I do like the fact that with uh, LED bulbs, uh, you can turn them on and they're basically instantly on. Whereas it does take some time for uh, compact fluorescence to get up to temperature, as it were. That means that, you know, you can use a LED bulb in an area where you're turning the light on and off a number of times. Whereas uh, it's more appropriate for compact fluorescence to be on for very long periods of time without too much switching. Uh, otherwise, it just becomes irritating. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, this is high, high efficiency here, and it has a 3000 Kelvin, so it's a little bit warmer than some light bulbs, but it is still cooler. Now, <clears throat> the latest ones I bought when these failed, and some of these failed, in fact, I had some older compact fluorescents, and you can see this is really old. Uh, uh, I installed these in the mid-2000s, and uh, it failed uh, about 10 years later, so... Uh, a very impressive life on this, but this was less efficient uh, compact fluorescent. So the last I bought are these type. Uh, and these are bang up to date uh, Osrams. Um, and uh, I like the idea that they will claim to be warm. Uh, they had 25,000 hours. So that was, you know, a whole 10,000 hours more than the compact fluorescent. Uh, and uh, they actually look quite nice when they're on. I, I don't like uh, the big yellow things when they're off uh, compared to a, a normal uh, uh, incandescent bulb look. 
but uh, it, it, it is quite attractive when it's on. So um, I was prepared but for the length of life and for the color rendering index and for the, the color temperature and for the wattage output and for the efficiency to stump up this ridiculous $13. So you could buy tw 26 or as many as 30 100 watt incandescent bulbs for the price of one uh, of these. Uh, and I actually bought quite a lot of them. And you can see I've got a whole handful of white here. Now, you might be asking why I haven't got these in my house currently. Well, they've all failed. They've all failed. And uh, maybe I got a whole series of bad batches as I changed them over a period of months. But the, the reality is, um, I don't think these lasted even as long as an incandescent bulb. And what have we got an in, in an incandescent bulb? We've essentially just got a resistor, a piece of uh, tungsten filament, and that's it. And and some metal supports and a glass envelope and some conductors and a in a you know base. That's it. In these, we have a whole bunch of electronics. You can see maybe at the bottom. And so uh, I comically say to myself that yes, the the LED itself is uh, going to last for 25,000 hours, but the uh, the electronics only last for 800. Um, extremely disappointing. And when you consider the cost uh, that uh, in terms of embodied energy in these light bulbs, um, they've got to be far, far in excess of uh, the old tungsten filament light bulb. And so um, I, I, I'm utterly shocked. And so when I came to replace these, what did I do? I went back to a compact fluorescent. And this was far cheaper and uh, has an even brighter bulb. Uh, it claims to be uh, a warm white, a color temperature of 2700. So equivalent color temperature. And, um, you know, uh, there we go. So. That is uh, what I've had to decide to do. And so I'm very, very disappointed uh, with this. You, you imagine if you were to replace these as frequently as um, uh, you had to, which it would appear to be with, with the incandescent, you, you would end up by costing yourself a lot, lot more money. Uh, you wouldn't be getting any uh, 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 measurable energy savings. But the, the embodied energy in making these uh, would do far more damage to the planet than these ones. So, you know, if you cannot have an LED light bulb in its whole, not just the element, but the whole of it lasting for the 25,000 hours, what are we really doing to the environment? Uh, so um, that's my beef on that. Uh, here is a package for one of these devices, actually a lower powered one, uh, which I bought for a, a different light. So there were attempts to keep the incandescent bulb alive because many people did like the quality of the light that you got out of it. And one of those was uh, in the early 2010s, uh, 2010s uh, by Philips. And they produced this thing called an EcoVantage. And they had effectively, I don't know if you can see it there, there was a, there was a halogen inside a normal sort of glass envelope of uh, a uh, normal uh, incandescent bulb. And what this did was the the uh, extra glass envelope reflected some of the infrared, because most of the energy is lost by infrared from an incandescent bulb. It reflected it back at the uh, um, the halogen bulb inside, and that meant that the input power uh, could be lower in order to maintain the uh, filament at a temperature that it would emit light. So you're effectively recycling some of the infrared that would normally be lost. And this would mean that uh, you would actually have 72 watts uh, equivalent to 100 watt standard uh, incandescent bulb. And so I'm giving all the links here, by the way, in these uh, tiny.cc links. So if you want to go and see the references, you can. Now, last year, MIT published some nanotechnology work where they're effectively trying to do a, an even better version of this by using nanotechnology and coating uh, the glass and effectively reflecting that IR component or a good proportion of it back at the element in the same way. And... Uh, 
Uh, that they uh, at that time last year they managed to achieve a 6.6 percent efficiency so if you imagine our original tungsten light bulb was tr at 2.5 percent efficiency uh, this is pr approaching sort of a uh, 150 percent higher like uh, uh, very significantly two and a half times uh, the output of light uh, compared to um, the standard uh, incandescent bulb and it's, a, it's definitely within the striking range of your uh, low efficient, cheap compact fluorescence and your uh, poor um, LED bulbs. Uh, however, this one's actually quite efficient. Uh, one thing you can see is that they actually have a flat element here and they've got the sheet of glass which uh, is presu presumably uh, covered uh, with this uh, material. So it's, it's not quite ready for putting in this envelope. But they do say that they expect to be able to achieve 40% uh, efficiency uh, using this method. Now, if they do achieve 40% efficiency, that will make the tungsten uh, incandescent bulb twice as efficient as the best kind of LED you can currently get. And then you have a scenario is if your tungsten filament lasts just as long as your overall package of your LED, but the tungsten filament bulb has better color rendering index and it is able to be as efficient, then you really would want to go for this kind of technology again. So uh, the tungsten light bulb may not be dead. The next section I want to talk about is really, really important to me, and I think it uh, could be important to you also. And that is the health implications of the switch to different lighting. Now, the truth is, throughout human evolution, our eyes have evolved to see in the full spectrum daylight. So non-incandescent bulbs have a typically 80% color rendering index, which I showed you earlier. So all the LEDs and compact fluorescents, they claim around about 80% color rendering index. Um, but they typically skew to blue uh, in LEDs, and this affects circadian rhythm. So I've got this uh, chart here, and it is from the Nature magazine, and I've given the source down there. Uh, but you can see here, uh, they are saying that in our uh, cool white uh, LED lamp, 4000 Kelvin here, um, you are looking at this very large peak of blue light. And this is what causes this belief that you are in the middle of the day. So in the middle of the day, uh, there's a lot more blue light when you are outside. And in the evening, there's a much less blue light. So this cues the brain to say, ah, oh, it's time to go to bed. So you get stimulated by this blue light. Now, you might want blue lights if you want to work your employees hard by uh, having a lot of LED lights in, in their computer screens and in uh, their working environment. Uh, so this would be, you know, <laughs> advantageous for you and, uh, uh, you know, your employees could recover on the weekend, let's put it like that. But for human health and for not putting your circadian rhythms out of whack, you wouldn't want cool white LEDs, uh, for instance, uh, in your bathroom. So the last thing you do at night is brush your teeth and you, you, if you went in there and you had a lot of cool uh, LEDs, uh, that's going to tell you it's the middle of the day and so you're going to have trouble getting to sleep and in fact computer manufacturers and phone manufacturers have got software now that uh, makes the blue component that they output from their screens uh, lower when it draws to evening and so they are actually trying to address this issue but still the led itself will still output more blue light as a proportion of the overall color spectrum the next point here is that infrared, specifically at 1 to 3 micrometers, is meant to make electrically charged easy water, making it flow easily in capillaries, according to Dr. Gerald Pollock. And I've given a link to the uh, TEDx where he's describing this. So what he found was, is that if you use specific frequencies of light that are in sunlight, then you are able to take the water, for instance, that is in your bloodstream and make it sort of charged in such a way that it flows easily through capillaries. 
And presumably, uh, incandescent lamps also have, because they tend towards the heat end of the spectrum, this is the problem, they lose a lot of their energy through heat. So these could be very good at providing this 1 to 3 micrometers of light, giving you this ability for your blood vessels in your body, uh, the very smallest of them, to function very, very well for the blood, blood to easily slip through them. So that would enable your skin to be healthy. Um, but the area in the body that has the highest density of capillaries is the kidney. Uh, and so that's uh, to be able to get toxins out of your body and pass them through your urine. Another area is in the lungs for gaseous exchange. Now, interestingly, if you were not outside much, or you were under compact fluorescent or LED lighting, and you spent a lot of time in those environments rather than under incandescent when you weren't outside, you might suffer from an inability for your capillaries to function as optimally as they should if you did get exposed to these kind of lights that you get from sunlight and potentially from uh, incandescent lights. So, for instance, if you had a disease like one uh, which is currently prevalent at the time of making this video uh, called SARS-CoV-2, and you were stuck indoors and you were not allowed to, say, go out and sunbathe and you were, had no access to incandescent lights, the organs that would fail in your body uh, or, or would be put at more stress are the kidneys and the lungs. And so there's a real serious health implication. In the 1917 flu epidemic, they found that people were having better outcomes health-wise if they were put outside. And perhaps this could explain why. Okay, the next on my list is electromagnetic and ultrasonic emissions from non-incandescent bulbs and electronics. And as I said before, this is basically uh, a resistor in an incandescent bulb uh, and it's got terminals. And that's essentially it. But if we look at our uh, LED bulb here, you can see the electronics down there and you can also imagine that there were electronics in here and in these compact uh, fluorescents here these big areas at the bottom here have transformers and other electronics in there and those uh, and i've done this i've actually got my ultrasonic um, microphone and i recorded uh, sounds uh, ultrasonic emissions here certainly in the um, switching circuits uh, and I imagine that there is uh, some sound coming out uh, in tune with the uh, electromagnetic uh, oscillations. So uh, that is pollution um, in your environment. Uh, will that affect things like dogs? I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether anyone's done a study on that. One could probably look into that in their own time. Now, when it comes to compact fluorescence, one real huge problem with them is that they have mercury, a small amount of mercury inside the actual tube, and that makes it extremely toxic. And believe this or not, if you actually break these in your house under a carpet, you're meant to kind of like get a proper toxic materials cleaning squad or something in to deal with them. And also, when you dispose of these, you're meant to take them to a proper electronic recycling center that, you know, often in hardware stores, they have a place where you, a bin that you can put these in. The very worst thing is, is uh, you often find these uh, tubes and the uh, long fluorescent tubes in fly tipping and even in domestic waste. And considering that that's got mercury in, in, in that mercury could then leach into the groundwater. So... It's really, really sad uh, that people don't understand the risks to the environment of the mercury that are in compact fluorescence. Okay, so last on the list is this one, and that is that fluorescent bulbs have been associated uh, with migraine, seizures, and lupus. Lupus is an uh, autoimmune disease. And uh, UV light from fluorescent lights uh, triggers rashes, particularly on the face, so you can get coloration of the face. And if you look here on the Nature uh, Papers uh, chart, 
You can see here it says UV can leak through faulty coatings. Let's have a look at our old uh, light here. So the mercury and the uh, discharge in there uh, combine uh, to make a lot of UV light and that needs to be converted into visible light. So they put a phosphor coating on the inside and if you look at this you can see that it is coming away here. It's mottled, it's broken. So while this light still works technically the longer I use it, the more I'm going to be exposing myself to ionizing radiation. So here we go. There we go. Look at that. Uh, this UV light. So it's really very damaged there. Um, and this one, you can see that there's a discoloration on this one. It's even older bulb. Uh, and uh, yeah, again here you see it's mottled. So while a bulb like this might still work, uh, is it safe? Um, certainly, I think lupus sufferers might complain. Uh, there seems to be some UV uh, leakage, uh, possibly even on some fresh bulbs. So I don't expect a lupus sufferer to want to have uh, fluorescent lights. Now this is very difficult, for instance, because many working environments and, and schools and hospitals uh, have fluorescent lights for the efficiency reasons. So, where can they go? <laughs> You've got to feel for them, really. And sometimes you don't even know that it's a fluorescent bulb, because th this bulb here actually is a compact fluorescent inside a kind of bulb that looked like might be, it looks like it might be a LED light, um, or even a normal type of light bulb. You wouldn't necessarily know. So, um, that's something to consider. There are some other points I'd like to make with respect to light in general. Uh, if we look at this compact fluorescent lamp here, which is 6000 Kelvin, you'll see there is a lot of green and a lot of orange. And when I was doing uh, videography work, I had uh, a series of uh, fluorescent lights, which were supposedly daylight, bright white lights. And I did find that they gave quite a green cast to things, which was sometimes a little bit challenging to color correct help for. Now, if you go for more modern lamps, like this one where it's uh, claiming a 2700 color temperature, then in this case, what they're doing is they're kind of muting down this uh, and, and pulling up this end of the spectrum to try and get a warmer color temperature out. But the result of that is that you end up in increasing the relative proportion of the orange. So someone uh, that you're lighting under uh, a so-called warm fluorescent lamp would end up looking more orange. And again, it's a problem. And because this is very spiky with the fluorescent light, and because in an LED light we have this big spike at the beginning, um, these things are harder to uh, uh, color adjust for than the incandescent light. And so with an incandescent light, because it's a smooth curve like this, we can either leave it as it is to give us a kind of sunset glow, or we can just adjust it by putting a, uh, a sort of a curve on the color adjustment here to make it look more like uh, daylight at noon by just pulling these up and pull them down because it's a fairly straight incline. Okay, I now want to talk about a slightly different subject and that is the role of potential cold neutrinos on life. In the 1990s, Alexander Parkhamov established that gravitational bodies could lend cosmic cold neutrinos and uh, this is uh, available for you to see in this book, Space Earth Human. And there is an Indian study, and what they did was they germinated mung beans. These are the sort of things you might have in your uh, Asian stir-fry. And they had it in an isolated system of seeds, water, and air. What the Indian nuclear researchers established in 2014 was that the closer the moon was to the Earth, the larger the amount of excess potassium they observed in their germinating mung beans. So this is quite interesting. Obviously, potassium is very important for plants. And as you go through the lunar cycle here, when the moon is not very close to the Earth, there doesn't appear to be uh, any real noticeable amount of extra potassium 
in the dry weight of the sprouted beans compared to the unsprouted beans. But uh, when you have the full moon, the super moon where it's closest to the earth, you have the greatest deviation from the norm. So this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Some people have um, done these type of studies with uh, germinating seeds and found that there was no uh, potential transmuted material in the germinated beans. Uh, But it may actually be because they had started their experiment in a phase where the uh, moon was not very close to the Earth. And they explain in their paper, and the link is here, that it's an electromagnetic phenomenon because they hadn't understood or considered the work of uh, Alexander Parkhamov. But one must also consider that we, when we were looking at uh, experiments with the MFMP, with uh, Suhas Ralkar's fuel, we were able to manipulate strange radiation uh, by using a magnet, and other authors have done that also. So their idea that it can be explained by electromagnetism uh, doesn't necessarily discount the fact that when you have two gravitational bodies closer together, the flux of lensed cosmic neutrinos uh, is is stronger. And that could be used by the plants uh, to uh, increase potassium in there. Now, why would that happen? Well, um, here's another aspect that you can consider. So we've gone from germination and we're looking at photosynthesis. And Parkhamov showed in, in the same book that an alive houseplant leaf placed in front of potassium-40 isotope could lower the detected variance uh, in beta. And uh, this was replicated by others. And I'm just going to show you that finding now uh, in brief. So uh, if you can see here, um, basically he's got a, a houseplant leaf, Eucharis grandifora, and uh, he's got a little disc made out of um, what does he say here? Uh, potassium 40 in potassium in the sort of natural potassium isotope ratio, and it's mixed with uh, epoxy resin to make a little disc. And then he puts the, I guess, the leaf on top, and then he's got a halogen Geiger counter uh, with a mica window offset from that. And uh, if it uses a piece of paper, it just sends the uh, amount of detected beta particles down uh, with with the plant it goes down but also uh, after a period of time the scatter of the results i.e. above and below the mean is uh, reduced uh, and it, that does not take place when it's just paper so uh, the chances here after the uh, initial period uh, it dr- drops a bit and uh, then it's much lower and then it raises again. So it looks like the plant is interacting with the ability for beta to be detected uh, in a way that paper does not. And this was also replicated using another house plant leaf by uh, scientists at the Moscow uh, Institute of Physics and Technology. And they used a, uh, what is it, a Sant Paulia butterfly leaf. And uh, they immediately or very soon saw a lowering of the variation around the mean. So uh, one could interpret this that that somehow the beta particle is uh, being regulated by the leaf. Or you could also interpret it that the neutrino coming from the cosmos is going through the leaf. Maybe it's being used and so only certain neutrinos or certain amounts of the energy of the neutrinos is able to reach the potassium 40 and so it kind of regulates the variation around the mean of the detected decay rate. So that that's a fascinating study. So somehow there is some interaction that affects the detection of potassium 40 decay betas. Now, in 1807, Sir Humphrey Davy isolated potassium via electrolysis. In fact, it was the first metal to be um, isolated via electrolysis by uh, using very dry molten caustic potash, potassium hydroxide. And this was recovered by taking the white potash uh, potassium carbonate from tree ash, and then you water leach that to make the potassium hydroxide. So... It's effectively taken from uh, tree ash, and uh, that's how you first got potassium. So here we have 
a relationship be between potassium leaves uh, decay rates and the fact that potassium is in plants and I did a previous video where uh, I uh, looked at studies that showed that most of the potassium in trees is actually found in the leaves and one might wonder why that is well when you look at the molecule uh, chlorophyll nitrogen and magnesium are absolutely critical to chlorophyll and this is obviously the compound that plants use to turn water and carbon dioxide into sugars and cellulose, etc. Well, in Constantin Mayle's book Neutrino Power, this one here, he suggests that the plant leaf can only absorb about 1% of incident light from the sun. And he says this is insufficient energy for photosynthesis. He argues that the chlorophyll molecule collects neutrinos and converts their energy into a free electron. He has this diagram here, and this is apparently the chlorophyll mo molecule. And he says this is basically like a Tesla antenna, and that the uh, neutrinos get trapped in here, and their energy, uh, the spin energy, is used to synthesize an electron. Um, I'm not sure I'm agreeing with that argument. I think uh, certainly without specifying cold neutrinos, I think there's very little chance of an interaction. But he says it's a, a resonant function because of the actual um, molecule and uh, the shape of the molecule. Anyway, you can go and read that. Uh, it's readily available. Um, but uh, what I will say is that I did a, a, an experiment um, sort of hypothesis and said, you know, if nitrogen and magnesium are in chlorophyll and you need a lot of energy in order to, you know, split carbon dioxide and water and, and reassemble that into uh, sugars and cellulose and proteins and whatever, then um, where is that energy coming from? Because Constantin Mayo saying it basically can't be coming from sunlight, um, which is an interesting thing to be saying. So I put into the uh, reaction calculator that we developed using Alexander Parkhamov's uh, data that he gave us and that um, Philip Power in uh, New Zealand developed. It's at nanosoft.co.nz. And uh, looking at uh, the most common isotopes of nitrogen, oxygen, and uh, magnesium and chlorine, I've got them here. Uh, we look at the most energetic here that yields 13.31 mega electron volts. And this is nitrogen-14, which is 78% of the air everyone's breathing. And magnesium-26, which is a common isotope of magnesium, uh, goes to a proton and potassium-39, the most common isotope of uh, potassium. And so you have a, a situation where on the left-hand side, you, you have the same number of baryons uh, as the right-hand side, except one... It is uh, 19 protons and 21 neutrons, and the other one is 20 protons and 20 neutrons. And what's happening here is a neutron is converting into a proton, and so you get the, the change of the balance between the neutrons and the protons, and an electron is emitted. Um, now, this isn't synthesizing the electron, it's releasing it effectively from the neutron by inserting a neutrino in this side of the equation. So whereas a neutron would normally decay to an electron and an antineutrino, by putting a neutrino in this side, you're basically cancelling out the neutrino and the antineutrino, and you just get the electron emitted. Now, of course, the uh, hydrogen here will want the electron, so uh, there's no net free electron, although it might be free for a period of time. Um, however, there is this 13.31 mega electron volts that is yielded. And where do we find a lot of potassium? We find a lot of potassium in leaves. And we know nitrogen and magnesium is in chlorophyll. Is this something to do with the way that, you know, photosynthesis actually works? Um, who knows? But I think it's something to consider. Okay, so that is a potential way that cold neutrinos could explain the observations that have been replicated. And that is actually quite an easy experiment for people to observe this potassium-40 decay rate variation change by placing a live plant leaf in front of a source. So then I want to talk about the relationship between gammas, cesium-137, exotic vacuum objects and cold neutrinos. Uh, this is from a uh, presentation that you can go to here. 
and uh, it's uh, some of the work of uh, Shishkin et al uh, over about nine years at Dubna, Science City. So this is where they've discovered a lot of uh, super heavy isotopes. And what they did was they found these craters on these uh, photographic plates and they were able to establish that, that the some sort of structure was carrying uh, ions uh, that, uh, of uh, element that it was traveling through and that these would then be ejected and they would form craters of a certain width and a certain depth based on the ions that were carried with these structures. And the structures, he calls them magnetotoroelectrical radiation and the ones that are neutral string vortex solitons and he specifically says that string vortex soliton is an ordered vortex structure of cold neutrinos um, because the interaction of a string vortex soliton with radioactive isotopes like cesium-137, like potassium-40, like carbon-14, changes the decay characteristics of these isotopes. And he also says that they observed these impact craters when they used sources such as cobalt-60 and 137 cesium. So here we have 137 cesium, and that is a gamma radiation emitter, and so is cobalt-60. And they also found that they uh, observed this in materials irradiated with gamma radiation, i.e. they exposed something to gamma radiation, and afterwards <laughs> the materials emitted uh, these uh, string vortex solitons. So it's almost like they were being created and they got stored in the material. Was the material a metal? I don't know, um, but that is something to consider. And he's saying that uh, the string vortex solitons are a form of exotic vacuum object. And because we know they travel through material, they must be in the dark or black mode. So here we have a relationship between uh, gamma, cesium-137, exotic vacuum objects, and cold neutrinos. And uh, this brings me on to my next area where I want to look at bacteria, yeast, algae, and cold neutrinos. And there's this work by Korlinova and Vysotsky, and they established that a syntrophic colony of yeast and bacteria could transmute 137 cesium into barium. And the assumption was in their paper that a possible reaction of the radioactive cesium-137 isotope utilization was cesium-137 plus a proton goes to barium-138 plus this energy. However, they're not saying that was the reaction, and they they obviously noticed that the the uh, gamma emission goes down for the cesium-137. However, they didn't do an isotopic study to see if it actually was barium-138. So it could really have been forced natural beta decay. So they suggest it could be going to 138 barium, but it could be that it was stimulated, i.e. cold neutrino stimulated decay uh, to 137 barium. Could this be occurring inside the bacteria? So the bacteria is absorbing the 137 cesium. It's in some organelle or some uh, structure within the bacteria, which is able to interact with the cold neutrinos or the uh, string vortex solitons that would be emitted from the 137 cesium due to its gamma emission. And that it does the uh, decay from 137 cesium to 137 barium or it's using cold neutrinos from the environment. Now, Francesco Cellani and others have found bacteria living in nuclear fuel pools. What do you get in nuclear fuel pools? Well, you get uh, beta uh, uh, isotopes, beta-emitting isotopes, and you also get uh, cobalt-60, which is irradiated iron, a neutron-irradiated iron, and cesium-137, which also emits a gamma. So, you know, uh, there are all the... Uh, things that uh, have been established at Dubna that uh, are sort of uh, cold uh, ordered vortex structures of cold neutrinos uh, which can be stimulated by gammas and they're all there and then uh, lastly um, more recently algae has been found living in nuclear fuel pools so where is the algae getting its photosynthetic energy from? We do know that there would be nitrogen and water in those uh, cooling ponds uh, for both bacteria and for algae. So potentially neutrinos are playing a role in all of these uh, strange observations and life is using it in every form. Now, that leaves us with the question. Does life use cold neutrinos? So I say, 
We have shown potential evidence for the use of cold neutrinos in seed germination, photosynthesis in algae, houseplants and trees, and processes in bacteria and yeast. Uh, since there are a vast floor of bacteria in and on our body, and the mitochondria that is found in our cells and those of other animals, plants and fungi, which are essentially evolved bacteria, is it not possible that the power plants in our own bodies can also interact with cold neutrinos? So that is my question. Now, do we get cold neutrinos from an incandescent bulb? Uh, here's the, our incandescent bulb and the filament that is currently lying at the bottom, uh, normally when it's in there, will operate at a temperature around 2500 degrees C. And if we look at the chart from Alexander Parkhamov's paper, which you can read here, and I discuss here, if you go to 2500 degrees C and go up, you are seeing here that about 25% of the condensed matter, that is solid metal or liquid, in the incandescent element is at a sufficient energy to synthesize cold neutrinos. So could the incandescent light bulb not only produce infrared of a suitable frequency, according to Gerald Pollack, to support good flow of blood through capillaries in the say kidneys and in the lungs and apparently that effect lasts for about one hour or so after you have been exposed to this light could light bulbs of the incandescent type which do not have the far infrared uh, reflected back onto their elements actually provide a health benefit to us in the form of uh, good blood flow, but also neutrinos that the structures in our body can use to beneficially manipulate matter. So in conclusion, I ask, what is the risk of a modern lifestyle? Alexander Parkhamov showed that solid matter can partially reflect cold neutrinos in a similar way that glass will reflect incident light. He actually used a telescope that was a metal dish to um, reflect a, a certain amount of cosmogenic cold neutrinos onto a beta isotope to stimulate the beta decay. This implies that building matter like steel and glass and, and rock and concrete and fiberboard or whatever could partially reflect the cold neutrinos that we would otherwise receive from the cosmos. So what would the effect on our physiology be of being trapped in our homes voluntarily or otherwise? Are we losing some connection to something that is absolutely vital, potentially, to our well-being? What is the cumulative effect of staring at LED-based devices and large screens sat in LED or fluorescent lit rooms at home, school and work? What is happening to our biological rhythms when we don't see as much natural light in a day as we evolved with? And could we have lost much more than we realise by moving away from the sun first and then from the incandescent bulb? I think if we have bulbs that cost 30 times as much, 25 times as much, and don't even last as long as an incandescent bulb, so you're never going to get the energy gains out of this. And it's got a lot more embedded energy. What are we actually doing? What are we actually doing? And the potential losses of health that the tungsten light bulbs could give us. Now, you could argue that the tungsten light bulb may stimulate beta decay in our bodies uh, in the form of potassium and carbon. But we've always lived with that. That may actually be beneficial. The body may actually be able to use that energy. So to close, I frankly do not think that modern lighting solutions are very good for us. Uh, I think that they are moving us away from what we evolved with. And I think the problem that we need to solve is not how we can make a very complicated, supposedly efficient uh, but high embodied energy light bulb uh, that has all kinds of emissions and problems and lack of emissions where you need them. 
but rather to make uh, energy that is non-environmentally damaging and cheap enough so that we can all go back to using the standard incandescent bulb. I'd love to see your comments and suggestions and your own research on this subject. Please drop it down in the discussion for the video and share this as widely as possible. Thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.